It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Today we're continuing our series on the lives of great religious books. Princeton University Press recently published the latest volume in the series that focuses on a Buddhist text called the Lotus Sutra. It's a book that explains how you can be a Buddha too. Donald S. Lopez Jr. is the scholar who joins us from the University of Michigan, where he teaches Buddhist and Tibetan studies. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. And don't forget to rate and review the show in iTunes. Donald S. Lopez Jr. joins us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thanks for coming on the Maxwell Institute podcast, Don. My pleasure. So we're talking today about a biography that you wrote for Princeton's Lives of Great Religious Books series. It's a biography of the Lotus Sutra. But I wanted to begin by talking a little bit about your background and how you came to do this book. So let's go back in time to 1972. You're at this place uh, at an apartment, I believe. There's a guy who reminds you of Matt Foley from Saturday Night Live, the motivational speaker. There's another guy talking about an ounce of hash. This is a really interesting scene you set the book up with. Yeah, so I was an undergraduate at the University of Virginia in the early 70s. And uh, one of my friends uh, said that his roommate was going to invite a Buddhist teacher over to the apartment that night, and would I like to uh, come over? So I did. I did that. And as I say in the book, I was uh, surprised to find a gentleman who was probably in his 40s, um, slightly overweight uh, jacket, and I think it was a plaid jacket and a tie. Uh, white short sleeve shirt, and uh, he didn't have long hair. He was not wearing Buddhist robes, and he was clearly uh, an American, Caucasian. And uh, so this uh, immediately sort of just uh, was very much at odds with my stereotypical view of the Buddhist master, which was quite vague at that time. And he had a little cabinet, wooden cabinet with him that he opened up, and there was a small statue of the Buddha inside. And he uh, got down on his knees and joined his hands and restart and started to recite something in a language I did not understand. And it turned out uh, that this was uh, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. He was uh, chanting the title of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, afterwards, they were serving the usual tea and cookies, and um, a guy came over uh, in the standard uh, uniform of the day, a denim work shirt and jeans, who was a uh, a friend and I guess perhaps a student of, of the gentleman, and he was uh, extolling the the virtues of, of chanting Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. And he said uh, at one point in our conversation, I'm not sure you're into this man, but I was chanting the uh, the name as I was walking down the street in Richmond the other day, and I looked down and I saw an ounce of hash. Uh, so that was uh, very much, uh, of course, I joined immediately and uh, <laughs> Uh, so this was my first encounter with a Buddhist teacher, and uh, now uh, having written this book, I know exactly what he was doing and appreciate the history that brought us together in that particular moment. But at, at the time, I was quite baffled, I have to say. What were you studying at the time? Well, I went to uh, to college, I think, to be a, a Shakespeare scholar. This was the early 70s, and as those of us who lived through those times uh, often say, that when people talk about the 60s, they're really talking about the 70s. And it was a time, of course, of the Vietnam War, uh, a great level of student uh, unrest on campuses, and a general sense that uh, Western civilization was entirely corrupt, that there was nothing there that was of any value to us. And so there was a turn toward uh, the mystic East among many students uh, of my generation. Uh, at that time, we just called it uh, Oriental mysticism or, or Eastern philosophy, and the difference between Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, all of these things were unknown to us. I think that's become kind of the stereotype now when people think it's interesting that you mentioned your first encounter wasn't uh, according to the stereotype you had. And now I, th I think the scene you described has sort of become a stereotype now that people would recognize. Uh, yes, absolutely. So I took a course on Chinese uh, philosophy out of just vulgar curiosity. And there I heard something about Buddhism, ended up taking uh, whatever courses were available at the time, very few uh, at the university, and then began studying uh, these languages like Tibetan and Sanskrit. And once you go down that path, there's really no career open to you other than the academy. And, and hence, uh, I ended up where I am today. 
At any point, um, did you become a practicing Buddhist? At, and then in addition to that, was there a point when you had, as you're going into the scholarship, kind of separated yourself from that? Or what's your relationship there? Well, yes. Yeah, so uh, certainly at that time, uh, those of us who were studying Tibetan Buddhism uh, were all practicing Buddhists. Uh, and we really were thinking about ourselves as kind of closet bodhisattvas, that we were uh, actually practicing Buddhists. And we would use the academy as the place for us to uh, study the Dharma and teach it to others. Uh, and so that was very much, I think, for, I won't speak for the entire generation of Buddhologists, uh, uh, but for many of us, uh, many of people who are great scholars today were monks. Uh, but I think most of us came in to the study of Buddhism with what we called at the time a personal interest. And uh, I think in my own case, that has, has continued to the present day, but uh, it's my relationship to the tradition is, is quite a bit more complicated probably than it was back then. And it, that's probably due to your subsequent study, is that? Yes, uh-huh, yeah. Okay, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later on as we talk about views about how the text came to be created and its background and stuff. I think we'll touch on that. But the way that it came about for you to write this particular biography for Princeton series, I think actually suggests a lot about Buddhist literature, about Buddhist texts, about the Lotus Sutra, uh, and about maybe the current American context for this type of, of ancient text. So you write in the introduction that Buddhism has a huge canonical literature, but it doesn't have a single signature text. So talk about how this book came to be part of the Princeton series and what that suggests about Buddhist texts in general. So uh, this series, which is called uh, Lives of Great Religious Books, was the brainchild of the religion editor at Princeton, uh, Fred Appel. And his idea was to have short, uh, nicely produced a reception history of, of various texts, uh, things like the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the Book of Mormon, Genesis, Book of Common Prayer, Job, uh, Bonhoeffer's Letters, uh, Augustine's Confessions. And so Fred wanted to have a, a representative uh, Buddhist text uh, among all of these other Christian and Jewish works. And uh, so he asked me whether I would do a book on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. His, his interest in that text was, of course, its great fame in the West. And so I reluctantly agreed to write that book. Uh, because I was uh, uncomfortable with that being representing the entire Buddhist tradition. But it is famous, and so uh, I ended up writing the, that first book for the series. But I told Fred that I would do so if he would agree to allow me to write a second book of my choice. And so then it became my task to choose a, the second Buddhist work among all of these other uh, Jewish and Christian texts, and I chose the Lotus Sutra. But narrowing it down was kind of a, an interesting task. You describe a little bit about that in the book. It was. So – uh, Fred's, uh, I think, quite correctly wants the, the work to be something with some name recognition uh, mm -hmm. in, in the population. And in, the, in Buddhism, we have three texts that have uh, names uh, in English, uh, the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, and the Lotus Sutra. I'd already written two books uh, about the Heart Sutra, despite the fact that it's only one page long. And the Diamond Sutra is famously difficult. Uh, as I say in the book, uh, one of my friends, Gregory Chopin, said that there's a scene in the text in which the Buddha's disciple, Sabuti, uh, begins to weep uh, at the Buddha's words. And uh, Greg has said that scholars weep also when they read the text because they can't understand what it means. Uh, so the Lotus, I think, has more of a story to tell. It's longer. And so I did choose the Lotus, although it does have the questions of authenticity, the same kinds of issues that I ended up had, had raised in the Tibetan Book of the Dead volume. So it's interesting to think about because, as you say, there's a huge canonical literature, but in terms of what's been transferred over into the American consciousness or, or translated, uh, there's only a few of those. Based on the huge amount amount of texts available. Why do you think that is? Uh, well, it, it's just, I think, the way the tradition developed uh, over such a long period of time, and the various canons that uh, came into existence long after the Buddha's death, uh, the, the tradition then spread very quickly across Asia, and different countries would kind of s identify certain texts as most important to them, which may not be important in other parts of the tradition. So, uh, as I think we'll talk about later, we have this split uh, among these works that are uh, ascribed to the Buddha, although written long after his death, and those that seem to be somewhat earlier. And we have have uh, geographically what the 19th century scholars called Northern Buddhism, the Buddhism of Tibet, uh, China, Japan, Korea, Mongolia, all accept these later sutras as the word of the Buddha, whereas those uh, in the South, uh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Burma, Cambodia, they reject those. And so there is no single text that everybody would agree upon, and there's never been um, 
a sort of a Buddhist pope who could identify such a text. And so for those reasons, we're left with these giant canons with different works being different, important at different historical periods and at different geographical locations. Okay, good. Yeah. And, and as we go, we'll talk a little bit about how the text spread and, and sort of the different schools of thought within Buddhism. But let's start with the name of the book right now. This provides a nice intro into the book, the Lotus Sutra. You write that in looking back at your choice of the text, you chose a text that is obsessed with authenticity and that the book's name itself is obsessed with authenticity. And I'll probably need your help here. Is it Sadharma Pundarika? Is that right? Very good. Okay, yeah. So the Discourse on the White Lotus of the True Doctrine. Go ahead and pull that name apart for us. Yes. So we begin, uh, let's start with the last word, sutra. Uh, sutra is a Sanskrit word that just means aphorism. Uh, but in Buddhism, a sutra is, is regarded as a discourse uh, spoken by the Buddha himself or rarely with his sanction. So once you see sutra in the title of a Buddhist text, it means that it's attributed to the historical Buddha. So lotus, as you just noted, is a real abbreviation of the rest of the, of the title. The rest of the title is Sadharma Pundarika. And so if we begin, begin with the, the lotus itself, the lotus is one of the symbols of Buddhism, uh, the flower that grows out of the mud but rises above it and blooms above the surface of the water. It's untainted by the dirt and the water, and so it's a symbol of enlightenment coming out of uh, samsara. And so, and it's a white lotus. But there's, there are other names for different blue lotuses and, and uh, sort of the generic lotuses. There are many words for lotus in Sanskrit, and so white lotus has been chosen here. But I think the most interesting term is sadharma. So, dharma is a word in Sanskrit which is famously untranslatable. It can mean doctrine, it can mean law, it can mean truth, it can mean duty. But in Buddhism, it, is, it means typically the doctrine, the teachings of the Buddha. And to that word dharma, they have added uh, the prefix sad, which means true. Now, Buddhism was, of course, in competition with Hinduism over much of its history, and Hindus also call their religion Dharma. So sometimes we'll see uh, Buddhists refer to their teaching as the Sadharma, the true Dharma, to distinguish it from Hinduism. Hmm. Uh, but in this case, uh, Sadharma is, is used to distinguish the teachings of the Lotus Sutra from other forms of Buddhism, other Buddhist texts that had existed up to that time. So that kind of signals this obsession with authenticity. So it's this idea of sort of being a, a pure representation of the truth of the Buddha kind of a thing. What, yeah, what the Buddha really meant, and as, yeah. as the Buddha says, you're right, yeah. Right, so in the first few centuries after the Buddha's passing, uh, various schools of thought developed and two major genres of texts took shape. This helps address the question of authenticity and, and where this text originated. So let's talk about those genres to help situate the Lotus Sutra. Uh, so scholars of Christianity and of the New Testament write art, scholarly articles about whether Jesus was born in uh, 3 BCE or 1 BCE. Uh, we don't have any of that specificity with, when it comes to the Buddha. Uh, when I was in school, we were always taught that the Buddha was born in 563 and died in 483. And over the course of my career, that date has changed a lot. So most scholars would today place the Buddha's birth around 480 of the Common Era and his death around 400 plus or minus 20. So we really are pretty vague when it comes to those dates. But it seems to be the case, and certainly when we look at other uh, Indian traditions, writing was not really considered a proper way to preserve sacred truths. Speech was the mode of communication. Uh, this word vach, which is a cognate of our word voice in English, uh, the, the truth was conveyed orally. And so, of course, the Buddha never wrote anything. Writing was known after the Buddha's time, but that was often just for commerce. And so the Hindu Vedas were memorized, the teachings of the Buddha were memorized, and chanted uh, by monks. And so we probably don't have anything that the Buddha taught being written down until almost 400 years after his death, which is, of course, a very long time. Uh, and so as those texts begin to be composed, at the same time, we have an explosion of writing in, in Buddhist India in which uh, groups of monks and nuns begin composing texts, which they call sutras, and which they uh, claim, and the texts themselves uh, were spoken by the Buddha himself. They begin with the standard formula, evam maya shuttam, thus did I hear. Uh, the Buddha was at this such and such a place. He was with such and such disciples. And so the format is exactly the same. But we know for 
all sorts of reasons that these are very late compositions. And so the question becomes, who is going to accept these later works as the true word of the Buddha and who is not? And the Lotus Sutra is perhaps the most famous of those early Mahayana sutras and the one that makes the strongest case for its authenticity, sometimes rather defensively against those who who would reject it. So there's kind of a division in thought about whether these texts go all the way back to the Buddha. And would a lot of practicing Buddhists disagree with that scholarly view of of when the text was put together? Uh, Yes, they would, yes. So uh, certainly in Tibetan Buddhism, Chinese, Japanese, Korean Buddhism, all of these Mahayana sutras are considered to be the authentic word of the Buddha. And that would be also accepted by uh, many uh, Western followers of, of those traditions. It seems like, I mean, do they do they think the literal writing down of it even dates that far back, or is the argument more about like, oh, well, the monks really memorized it really well, so by the time it was recorded, it was just locked in? Uh, well, they would say that, uh, yeah, it was just written down later. Uh, there are some texts that were supposed to have been uh, discovered, that they were kept in a heaven by some gods, or they were kept under the ocean. Uh, there are many reasons that are given by the tradition itself uh, for the, the, the late appearance of these texts. But they all, they do claim to be of the word of the Buddha, yeah. As you're talking about this in a university setting, do you ever encounter students who come from a more traditional Buddhist background that this kind of discussion is difficult for them to reckon with? Uh, not so much. I mean, I, I certainly have many uh, Asian and Asian American students who have some Buddhist background, but uh, typically they would not know much of the history of the text themselves. And so that has not come up so much. Okay. Um, so let's talk about this self-praise that we see in the text. You talk about it in the biography. So like a lot of Mahayana sutras, the lotus has a really high opinion of itself. We repeatedly see self-promotion throughout the book. Since this is common in a lot of sutras, what are some things that made the lotus stand out compared to all these other texts that do the same thing? Uh, well, the lotus does it quite eloquently, and uh, much of the content of the sutra itself is devoted to this uh, self-praise. We can understand this historically because what we have is really a, a very small minority of monks and nuns who are, who are trying to proclaim a new vision of, of, of Buddhahood and of the Buddha and of the Buddhist path in general. And so in order for them to uh, make their case, the Buddha himself, uh, as as they present him, must be extolling his own teachings above precisely what he had taught before. And therefore, the Buddha gives an elaborate argument uh, in the early chapters explaining that I did say all these things about the Four Noble Truths and the and Nirvana and all these things that everybody knows about, but now here toward the end of my life, I'm going to explain that I didn't really mean what I meant back then. I, I talked about that for very expedient reasons, and now I'm revealing the truth. And so, so in order for the text to have some authenticity with its readers or with its listeners, the Buddha himself has to explain or explain away the earlier tradition, and hence the self-praise becomes very important. It, it shows development in the tradition um, and trying to negotiate not sort of cutting the head off of the tradition, but building on or adapting the tradition. Well, of course. I mean, those previous texts, we have right a, a tradition that's already been going on for 400 years before the text uh, comes into existence. And so they can't say that the Buddha didn't teach these things. They have to be accounted for. And that's one of the challenges. That's one of the dilemmas of, for, for the authors. Okay, we're about to dig into the specific plot and overview of the book. But one other question before we do that is, why did this particular text sort of rise to the top where it's at in terms of its fame compared to all the, a lot of these other texts? Well, it's beautifully written. Uh, It is a work by authors uh, whose names we do not know, who were very well versed in the tradition. And so there is a a kind of a doctrinal and rhetorical power about, about their arguments. Whether a text becomes important or not is due to all sorts of uh, factors of patronage, uh, when it was spread, when it was translated. So that's a long story. But I think one of the reasons that the Lotus Sutra has survived this long is, first of all, because it does make such a powerful case for its own efficacy. And secondly, just in terms of a work of literature, it has many parables. Uh, and so it has an accessibility that some of the more sort of philosophically arcane, arcane texts do not. Okay, good. So to get into an overview uh, of the book a little bit more specifically here, you've hinted at this already, but you say that the Lotus Sutra contains two really big revelations 
within the Buddhist tradition. So describe kind of how the book is shaped, like what the genre looks like, the parables. What does it look like compared to something like the Bible, for example? Uh, well, it begins with the Buddha uh, seated on Vulture Peak, which is a place in India, a historical place where we know that he, uh, where many other sutras are set. Uh, and without him saying a word, uh, which he would typically do at the very beginning, he emits a ray of light from between his eyebrows and illuminates a large uh, portion of the universe. And there are some bodhisattvas in the audience who are puzzled by this. And uh, uh, one of the bodhisattvas says, uh, you know, I've seen this once before. Many, many aeons ago, a different Buddha uh, illuminated this portion of the universe. And after that, he taught the Lotus Sutra. So I think he's about to teach the Lotus Sutra. And so this is a very clever device uh, by the authors to show that what the Buddha is about to teach now toward the end of his life is something that previous Buddhas have taught aeons ago. So it's not new, it's very old. And no one, it's so old that only this one Bodhisattva remembers that. So then the Buddha begins speaking and he says, uh, I, I want to talk about the nature of, of Buddhahood, uh, but it's so hard to understand. I, I, I'm just probably not going to explain it to you, he says to a monk. And the monks, of course, uh, ask him to please explain it. And the Buddha then introduces probably the most famous term in the sutra, upaya, a term that's translated as method or expedient means. And what the Buddha says is that uh, everything I've taught up to this point in my teaching career has been expedient. And there is a, a teaching beyond that, which I will reveal. And so it's at that point that he uh, relates uh, one of the most famous parables, which I'm also happy to do. Yeah, like. let's yeah. do that. Okay, let's, okay, let's okay. Give people yeah. an idea of like what these parables look like. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, by far the most famous parable. It's called the parable of the uh, of the burning house. And so in the parable, a father uh, who seems to be a widower uh, has a, a large mansion in which his children are playing. And uh, despite the fact that he's a very rich man, uh, this house is described as being uh, falling apart and uh, the children are inside playing their various games when a fire breaks out. And there's only one doorway into the house. The father has so many children that he knows that he cannot go in and save them one by one. So he has to call out to them and tell them there's a fire. And uh, despite the fact that he's screaming fire, they don't pay any attention. So uh, being a, a skillful parent, uh, he tells his children that waiting for them outside are three carts. A cart uh, drawn by a goat, a cart drawn by a deer, and a cart drawn by an oxen. And when the children hear that there are these three carts, uh, they're delighted at that, and they all run out of the house. They're all saved. Uh, and when they get outside, there's just one cart. And it's a fabulous cart with all sorts of bells and uh, beautiful cushions and silks. Uh, and it's pulled by uh, one uh, beautiful white oxen. And so uh, the children are all happy, and that's the end of the parable. And uh, the Buddha then says to his interlocutor, a famous monk, uh, did the father lie? Was that a lie to say that there were three carts when indeed there was only one? And the monk says, uh, no, it was not a lie. He wanted to save his children, and it was fine for him to say that because uh, he got them out and he saved their lives. And the Buddha says, well, this is like my teaching. I am the father. All sentient beings in the universe are my children. And this uh, cycle of birth and death, this samsara, this is the burning house. And so in order to free my, my, ch my children, to save them from this conflagration, I tell them that there are three different paths to enlightenment available to them. One is a path of what's called the disciple. One is called the Pratyeka Buddha. This is a, kind of a, called the solitary Buddha. It's a strange category in the tradition. And the third path is the path of the Bodhisattva. And those indeed are the three paths that existed in the tradition up to that point. Before we uh, encapsulate yeah, sure, to the yeah. one, expand yeah. on those just a little bit on each of those. Because does it sure. involve like the practice that they do in order to uh, achieve enlightenment? Yeah. So uh, the Shravaka, this uh, first one, which is this, is a disciple, this would just be what we would consider a standard Buddhist monk in the ancient tradition who uh, heard the Buddhist teachings and then practiced the path and achieved nirvana. And so what nirvana means is going to be a uh, a big question in the second part of the Lotus Sutra, so we'll put that on hold for a moment. But nirvana in the early tradition meant uh, the extinction of, of rebirth. That is, you die and you're not reborn. And there is no consciousness, there's no physical form. It's just a, a, a form of extinction of suffering. And that's, yeah, so, that's, per, that's yeah. like preferred because you don't have to go through suffering. Exactly. And, yeah, okay. Yep. And the second uh, path of the Pratyeka Buddha is a variation on the first one. It has some differences we don't need to go into. But anyway, those first two paths are individuals who are seeking nirvana for themselves. 
The third person, the bodhisattva, this is the rare individual who makes a vow to free all beings from, from, uh, from rebirth, and that person follows the much longer path to Buddhahood uh, out of compassion for the world. And in the early tradition, uh, this bodhisattva is a very rare figure. Only, we only need one Buddha per historical era. And so uh, our, our Buddha was a bodhisattva. Now he's the Buddha. There'll be a Buddha in the future. And so these people who are taking this vow to achieve Buddhahood will do so in the far distant future. And they're the rare individual, the first two are much more common. So those are the three. And those developed early on in the tradition. And then Absolutely. by the time the Lotus Sutras developed, what this book is going to do is say, okay, yeah, I said that there were these three things, but it's really just this one. Exactly. Okay. So those three were well known at the time of the Lotus and just accepted as, as doctrine, as orthodoxy. And what does the Lotus uh, give for that one path now? So what the Buddha says is that I, I didn't really mean that uh, when I said there were three vehicles. There's only one, and he, he, he calls it by two names. One is the Ekayana, which just means the single vehicle, and the second one is the Buddhayana, the Buddha vehicle. And what he means by that is that there is only one path out of samsara, and that is to become a Buddha oneself, and this is revolutionary. I'm, I'm wondering why. With my limited background, I, I, I don't know much about Buddhism. So when, when an audience would hear this or read this in the text, what would that, be, what would that say to them? Well, it's interesting that, that you respond that way because I think the Lotus Sutra is so famous that what I just described sounds like, oh, well, that's just Buddhism. Everybody's going to become a Buddha. Uh, but at the time of its composition, this was a very radical thing to say because it was saying that the Buddha himself says in the sutra that I achieve Buddhahood myself. What kind of, I, of a teacher would I be if I taught a lesser attainment to these disciples that I love so much? And so he teaches that highest goal to everyone. Uh, and it had not been taught that way in the past. So basically saying that uh, everybody, everybody will become a Buddha. And in another parable, which we can talk about if you like, he, he suggests that there's no such thing as nirvana, that even the idea of nirvana was an expedient device. And so these at the time were very radical statements. I mean, do you think in context it would be similar to a Christian figure appearing and saying, I'm Jesus and, you know, I, I talked about you going to heaven or whatnot, but really you're going to become a Jesus kind of a thing. Would it be exactly. sort of like that? Yep. Like it would be shock? like that. Yeah. Yes. And so you talk about in the book how the text has to engage in what you call strategies of legitimization. So because the claim is so big and so revolutionary, it's got to legitimize itself. So talk about those strategies a little bit. So there are a number of strategies uh, that the text uses, one of which is to use uh, well-known figures from the earlier tradition and make them characters in the Lotus Sutra. The most famous of these is a, is a monk named Shariputra, and he's renowned in Buddhism as the wisest of the Buddha's disciples. He's a monk. So he should know everything, and yet he doesn't know about this single vehicle, and he is baffled by the Buddha's statement. And it's the Buddha who asks him, was I telling a lie when I, when I said there were three vehicles? And he says no. And so the, the heroes of the early tradition, the tradition that believed in three vehicles, the tradition that believed in nirvana, they are drafted into the Lotus Sutra in a certain sense. They are made uh, advocates of the Lotus Sutra, and they all, they all begin to clamor for prophecies that they themselves will become Buddhas. And so one of the fascinating things about the text is that the, the characters in the sutra, despite its, its relatively late date, are all very well known. They're taking the heroes, the saints of the tradition, and having them assent to what the Buddha says. And so if Shariputra and Ananda uh, and the Buddha's stepmother all are asking for prophecies and all wanting to become bodhisattvas, then that suggests that this late, late teaching, which is late historically, it's also late in the Buddha's career. It's supposed to be taught uh, just a few years before his death. That gives a certain level of legitimacy because despite the fact that the teaching is new, the participants, the interlocutors, the characters in the work are, are well known and old. Maybe it could even make a, a recipient of the text feel like, well, if, if those great people didn't even know about it, I shouldn't be surprised that I didn't at this point. Either, exactly, exactly right. Yeah, so everybody reveres Shariputra. So if Shariputra is asking questions and Shariputra is won over, then I should be as well. Exactly. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, the Buddha's stepmother, I think you mentioned. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the place of women in, in this text. 
Well, uh, so the place of women in Buddhism is uh, probably the topic for another conversation, but it is the case that uh, the Buddha's, so the Buddha's mother died uh, seven days after his birth, and he was raised by her sister, and she was the one who uh, asked him to establish the order of nuns. Uh, which, at least according to the story, he did uh, only reluctantly. And so she became a nun. The Buddha was married as Prince Siddhartha before he went out in search of enlightenment. Uh, so his wife became a nun. And both the Buddha's stepmother and his wife are present in the audience. And they, at a certain point in the text, uh, well, let me just backtrack for a second. So mm -hmm. in the early tradition, one can only become a bodhisattva, that is, someone destined for Buddhahood, if one receives a prophecy from a living Buddha. So one actually makes the vow to achieve Buddhahood in the presence of a Buddha, and the Buddha says, I make, I prophesize that in such and such an aeon, by such and such a name, you shall become a Buddha. So that was standard doctrine. So in the Lotus Sutra, everybody wants to get this prophecy because the Buddha has said, now you will all become Buddhas. And so he gives them to all the famous monks, and then later on, both his stepmother uh, and his wife ask for prophecies, and those are also bestowed. So they will both become Buddhas. Uh, however, the text does want to say that one can only become a Buddha in a male body. And so uh, they are receiving the prophecy in this lifetime, they will become Buddhas in the far distant future, and they will do so as males. So they'll have to go through another cycle. and uh, Well, the path of the Bodhisattva is, is literally billions of lifetimes. And so okay. when Buddha is making these prophecies, he's not saying you're going to become a Buddha tomorrow or in your next lifetime. He's just saying at some point in the future. And again, that's very standard. So today, practicing Buddhists have to receive a similar kind of prophecy? Uh, well, so when, uh, for example, the Dalai Lama in India will often give the Bodhisattva vows – to an uh, audience of hundreds and sometimes thousands. And part of that uh, ritual is for him to uh, take on the role of the Buddha himself and make a prophecy uh, en masse for everyone there that they will become a Buddha in the future. So at least uh, in the Tibetan tradition, that still goes on to the present day. Hmm. Okay. That's Donald S. Lopez, Jr. He's a professor of Buddhist and Tibetan studies at the University of Michigan, and he, we're talking today about the biography he wrote about the Lotus Sutra as part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Books series. So back in your biography's introduction, Don, you make a statement that I think could be applied to any book in Princeton's series. I like this. You, you write that the Lotus Sutra is important not only for what it says, but for what it does – and what can be done with it. And that's a good way to set the stage for the rest of the book. Let's talk about student reactions when you go through the Lotus Sutra with them. And, and you say it tends to provoke outrage in your students. It's a strong word. So talk about that kind of a reaction. Well, so I try to teach uh, my Introduction to Buddhism class uh, historically. So I begin with uh, what we know about the historical Buddha, and I talk about the early tradition as we know it. And that is the tradition where there are these three vehicles, and, and where nirvana is the goal, and where there is just a single Buddha. Uh, there is the Eightfold Path, Four Noble Truths, all the basics are there, and that takes about the first half of the class, that is up until the, uh, the midterm. And then after the midterm, I begin to introduce uh, the, the later tradition, and I always begin with the Lotus Sutra. I actually have the students read the entire sutra, and they are generally disturbed, uh, sometimes upset, and in some cases outraged uh, by this idea that everything's being changed. That is what they see, uh, and again, this is part, I think, of the stereotype of Buddhism in the West, of the Buddha as uh, as just an ordinary person uh, who followed the path to enlightenment through his own efforts and then taught this ethical system and a practice of meditation, all these things that I think fit very well with our kind of modernist view of the Buddha, uh, to have all of the kind of almost uh, psychedelic moments uh, in the sutra, and the Buddha uh, going back and saying, I didn't mean this, and uh, shooting rays of light from between his eyes, all of this uh, they find somewhat disquieting, and they they, they like the uh, the old Buddha, and they don't like what this new Buddha is having to say. It's, it's like sort of supernatural, to, and, and that discomforting. Part of this is part of it supernatural, but part of it is just the repudiation of the earlier tradition, which they, by this point they have become uh, quite uh, they've come to admire. Yeah. And they kind of would resent that in the culture. So would they see that as happening like as a historical corruption of the tradition or something? Yeah, they're sort of saying who who you know they just made this stuff up. What, what right did they have to 400 years after the, after his death to just change everything and then to claim that he said it? So they they are yeah they don't like that. And how do you respond to those type of reactions? 
Well, you know, what I say is that we really, uh, it's very difficult for us to uh, recover what the Buddha really taught, uh, despite the fact that uh, this text is clearly written late. Nothing's written down until about 400 years after his death, and religions evolve, and uh, we know that texts are written at different times, and yet they somehow become integrated into the tradition, and we have many examples across various religions in which that happens, and so I I try just to get them to uh, take perhaps a larger perspective on the issue and look at it in terms of uh, the way that religions change and evolve over time. And remind me again, like the exact uh, time period in which the text was probably composed? Well, uh, we think that the first chapters may have appeared sometime around 50 BCE, but the Lotus Sutra is a work that really evolved, and uh, it may not have really reached its the form that we have today until uh, perhaps uh, 220 of the Common Era, so almost 300 years later. And we know that chapters were added in, and things were changed, and so there's a long evolution of the text. And how do you gauge the significance of the Lotus Sutra in that India context way back then? How could you even tell if that was an important text compared to something else? Well, we look at the number of commentaries when the Lotus Sutra is actually relatively few. Uh, we look at the number of manuscripts that are discovered, and in the case of Lotus Sutra, that's there. Are, there are actually are some, uh, but the Lotus Sutra was clearly not as important as in, in India as it would become in China and in Japan, and actually not so important in Tibet. In fact, it's really in China and Japan that it really takes off. And let's talk about that. But one other thing too, you, you mentioned. Um, Upaya, or how do you pronounce that? Yeah, Upaya, yeah. Upaya, yeah. You mentioned that earlier. This is really interesting because you're talking about how that's sort of challenging a tradition by using that very tradition. And there's an ironic thing that happens in India where people take that step once again to use the same strategy to sort of almost challenge what the Lotus Sutra does. Exactly. So the upaya is a slippery slope. I mean, so if the Buddha is going to say, I didn't really mean what I said before, then someone can write another text in which the Buddha says, and I also didn't really mean what I said in the Lotus Sutra. Uh, And something like that happens in which uh, the upaya and the single vehicle is itself uh, presented as an expedient device and the three vehicles are restored uh, in a slightly different form. Yeah. So as the Lotus Sutra is making its way to China in the first century of the Common Era, or somewhere thereabouts. What's something that stands out to you in in how it's received there? Well, uh, so we have to remember that religions evolve historically uh, in the place of their origin, and that historical evolution is not often known uh, when that tradition moves to a a different locale. And so in the case of China, uh, they did not receive uh, Buddhist texts uh, in the historical order that we understand them to have been composed. They received them in a rather haphazard way. And so one of the benefits of the Lotus Sutra is that it, it explains what had come before and in a certain sense, explains it away. Hmm. That is, all of these things about three vehicles, the Buddha says, don't worry about that, I didn't really mean it. Uh, What I have in this text is all you need to know. And so we find then Chinese Buddhism being a very much of a sutra-based tradition where a single sutra will provide the basis for an entire school. Uh, And that was the case uh, with the Lotus, uh, one of the most important schools of uh, of Chinese Buddhism, the Tiantai, took the Lotus as its focus and used that to interpret the rest of the tradition. And so it's really the fact that the lotus is a kind of a self-contained world. Uh, That kind of world is very appealing when all of these texts are coming in in different languages, teaching different things. There's no way to make sense of that. And the lotus sort of provides that, provides a way of making sense. So from China, it also a few centuries later makes its way into Japan. And is there anything surprising that happens to the text there in Japan that, that people are surprised to hear about? Well, in Japan, uh, the lotus uh, becomes very popular, and it, and there are many commentators, and the, the Chinese uh, school of Tendai uh, becomes extremely influential in Japan in its Tendai form. But in the book, I talk particularly about uh, a 13th century uh, Japanese monk called Nichiren, uh, who is the great uh, proponent of the Lotus Sutra, and who extols it above all other Buddhist texts and gets into trouble for doing so, and he's a fascinating character. Hmm. People can read more about that in the biography of the Lotus Sutra. It's from Princeton University Press. It was published just this year. In 1844, the Lotus Sutra arrives in Boston. Maybe instead of just giving a chronological overview or something, you can talk for a minute about a few of the people who made that happen and and what motivated them, how that came about. 
Right. So this goes back to a, a British uh, officer of the East India Company in Nepal named Brian Hodgson, who had nothing to do in Kathmandu and found out that there were Buddhists uh, in the city. And so he collected a bunch of Sanskrit manuscripts and sent them back to Europe, one of which was the Lotus Sutra. It arrived in Paris in 1837 and was translated uh, into French by a scholar named Eugène Brunouf, who held the uh, only the chair of uh, Sanskrit studies at the Collège de France. Bernouf then wrote some articles about the Lotus Sutra. Those were read in Boston by the uh, transcendentalists, uh, Emerson, Thoreau, and, and others. And uh, uh, Bernouf's essays were translated by Elizabeth Palmer Peabody in 1844 and published in The Dial. So a, a little essay about the Lotus Sutra and a chapter from it, uh, translated from Bernouf's French uh, by Elizabeth Peabody, was published in 1844. So that was the first arrival of the Lotus Sutra in North America. And some of the interest there in terms of motivation, I, I know one of those figures saw in the parables something comparable to Christianity. Yes, and so uh, Bernouf writes a letter uh, back to uh, Hodgson thanking him for sending the Sanskrit manuscript and explaining very clearly that he was just kind of browsing through them and found you know, a couple of very famous ones not that interesting and started reading the Lotus. And pretty soon in the Lotus, you get to the parable of, of the burning house and then after that, there's the parable of what uh, Bernouf calls the prodigal son, which, of course, has its own resonance with Christianity. And so it was fa actually the fact of the parables, I think, that caused Bernouf to translate the text. And uh, and so, and he does say that I find a certain uh, Christian spirit uh, in this work, uh, which is different from uh, what I see in other forms of Buddhism. So uh, that, yeah, that was quite a, I think that really was part of his inspiration for translating the text. And that was translation was published uh, after his death in uh, 1852. Is he the one that uh, began using the word parable? Is that yes, correct? Yeah, he was the one who translated the Sanskrit term as parable, and actually did call the story the prodigal son, uh, despite the fact it's not quite the same as the uh, as New Testament version. Uh, that's Donald S. Lopez Jr. He's the Arthur E. Link Distinguished University Professor of Buddhist and Tibetan Studies at the University of Michigan. And today we're talking about his latest book. It's part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Book series. It's a biography of the Buddhist text, the Lotus Sutra. We'll take a brief break and come back for the rest of the interview. I've both lost and found God a hundred times over, writes Ashley May Hoyland in her book, 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly. Stories for restless souls like you who desire to know God more deeply. This Latter-day Saint author and artist explores the complexities of everyday faith through story and picture. For Hoyland, laughter, sorrow, and creativity emerge as gospel principles alongside faith, hope, and charity. 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly is part of the Living Faith series at Brigham Young University's Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. Visit bit.ly slash 100 birds to learn more. Donald S. Lopez Jr. joins us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan. He's a professor of Buddhist and Tibetan studies at the University of Michigan, and we're talking about the Buddhist text, the Lotus Sutra. Don, in your final chapter, you say that the Lotus Sutra is a book of twos, and I thought it would be a nice way to wrap things up to talk about what you meant by that. The early commentators in uh, in China uh, noticed that the book sort of falls into two halves, and they identified a uh, a central teaching to the first half and the second half, and then those two halves then took on a kind of a life of their own in the, in the later tradition. Uh, Eugène Bernouf, who translated the Lotus Sutra, wanted to make a distinction between the simple sutras, which he called the, what he really considered to be the teaching, true teachings of the Buddha, and the developed sutras, these more ornate, uh, almost Baroque works, in which he placed the Lotus Sutra, which he thought were much later. And so there's always this dichotomy between the early tradition, late tradition, first half of the text, second half of the text, simple sutras, developed sutras. And it's in the second half of the sutra that the Buddha reveals his true identity, and that has become, again, along with upaya, along with skillful means, along with expedient devices, the central teaching of the text. Yeah, it's interesting to see this sort of human Buddha being presented and then this cosmic Buddha being presented. Correct, yeah. So in this if the in the second half of the text, if I can briefly tell another parable, the Buddha describes a, a father who is a physician. Uh, and his sons uh, have taken poison, and some of them are uh, – they haven't died, but they're sick. They're crazed by this poison. He gives them the antidote, and they won't take it. 
Uh, so he's in despair. How can I save my sons? And so he uh, goes off. He says, I'm leaving town. I'm going away. Uh, and he sends a servant back to tell the, the children, uh, your father has died. And they're so shocked by their grief that they sort of snap out of their delirium and they take the antidote and, and they're cured. And then he comes back and he says – I'm not really dead, but I couldn't really get your attention uh, without your thinking that. The Buddha says – the Buddha then explains the uh, the parable in this way. He says that uh, I, am the, I am the physician father. You, uh, you are my children. Uh, you think I'm going to enter nirvana and that gives an urgency uh, to your practice because you know I'm not going to be around long. But in fact, my lifespan is immeasurable. I will not enter nirvana uh, for aeons and aeons and aeons. Uh, in fact, uh, essentially, I, I will live – almost forever, whether it's forever or not, is something uh, that's debated by the commentators. Hmm. But it really, what the Buddha says then is that um, all the things that I did earlier in my life, uh, I was the prince, uh, I, was dis I was depressed about life, I took the four chariot rides, I practiced asceticism for six years, I achieved enlightenment under the tree. Uh, you think that, that that's what I did. In fact, all that was a, was a display, all that was an act. I was enlightened aeons ago, and I only, for the sake of the world, I go through the motions of pretending to have doubts about the nature of reality, and I pretend to practice, pretend to meditate, but I've been enlightened for aeons and aeons, and my enlightenment, my Buddhahood will also last for aeons. And so it's this cosmic Buddha, this previously, long previously enlightened Buddha who will live for it ever and ever in a certain sense. Uh, that's the cosmic Buddha of the second half of the text, and that becomes a very central figure in, in, in later interpretations of the work. So in the first half of the text, the Buddha sort of distances himself from his earlier teaching, right? Explains it away in a certain sense, and in the second half of the text, he reveals his true identity. Yeah, and it's interesting to see, especially in the American context or in the European context, how they dealt with that. Bernou, for example, in his own words, would focus more on that human Buddha. He looked at the historical Buddha as this social reformer fighting against the corruption of the priesthood, maybe looking at him through a Protestant lens and appreciating some similarities there. And But then in his translation, he sees the cosmic Buddha. He just didn't seem to highlight that when he was writing about it. Yeah, he, he saw it. He didn't like it. Uh, yeah, whether he was, to what extent he was even a, a Christian is a, is a question. He was certainly uh, very much uh, anti-clerical, anti-Catholic. We know that from his, yeah. from his life. Uh, so, yeah, Bernouf really thought that uh, the Lotus Sutra was written by monks with too much time on their hands. Uh, this was a, this was they were written uh, in cloisters where monks could just uh, sort of fantasize about the person of the Buddha lacking the sort of uh, social uh, upheaval and, and, and almost political challenges that the Buddha faced in his early teachings, which Bernouf saw as the more authentic ones. Yeah. Yeah. One other binary that I wanted to talk about, too, is that the text has been used historically to promote world war as well as world peace. And I think a lot of people today would be surprised to hear that because Buddhism is seen as a very peaceful tradition to people who, you know, aren't looking at history or even some of the current global conflict that's going on. So talk a little bit about how that text could be used to both promote world peace or world war. Well, uh, so the the World War, both of these actually occur uh, in Japan, and so as the Japanese Empire is uh, is building its military uh, in the early part of the 20th century, there are proponents of the Lotus Sutra who believe that spreading the Lotus Sutra around the world militarily uh, will help uh, establish, a, bring about a kind of a millennium. And so we have uh, right wing figures, even among the Japanese fascist government at the time, who were devotees of the Lotus. Sutra. After the war then, of course, uh, the Lotus Sutra became seen as, as an instrument for peace and uh, has been used also in that way. But it, during the uh, early 20th century and especially leading up to the, uh, the Second World War, there were advocates and proponents of the Lotus who, who felt that uh, spreading the Lotus uh, via uh, Japanese militarism was a way of bringing about a uh, sort of, a, a, as I said, like a millennium. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, it's fascinating to see how the same text can be used to such different ends and we, we see this again and again in this yes we do yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah well i appreciate you taking the time to talk about the book today before we go um what have you got cooking right now well, I've just translated a text from Tibetan of a, uh, a Jesuit missionary who went uh, to Tibet in the early uh, 18th century. His name is Ippolito Desideri, uh, a Tuscan, and uh, he wrote a detailed uh, refutation of the doctrines of rebirth and emptiness in 
Tibetan. Those, so those works uh, in, in very nice classical Tibetan have languished in the uh, Jesuit archives uh, in Rome for uh, quite some time. And, uh, and a Tibetan friend of mine, Tuktim Jimba, and I have translated some uh, selections from those works uh, just to sort of look at the whole question of missionary activity. We have, uh, in many cases, in the case of Buddhism, dismissed what missionaries have said because we've sort of concluded, well, they don't really understand what they're talking about. And so we don't have to take this seriously. But Desideri understood Buddhism very well and wrote uh, some quite interesting refutations of these two central doctrines. So that's coming out uh, from Harvard, uh, I think, in, in April. Hmm, excellent. Thank you. That's Donald S. Lopez, Jr. He's the Arthur E. Link Distinguished University Professor of Buddhist and Tibetan Studies at the University of Michigan. He's written the Princeton Dictionary of Buddhism, a biography of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And today we spoke about his biography of the Lotus Sutra in Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Book series. Don, thanks for taking the time to join us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.